Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Borg Warner. Feel good about driving. Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by Dow Automotive Systems, improving durability and increasing design flexibility with Betamate structural adhesives at DowBetamate.com. Hello and welcome to a brand new AutoLine Daily in TGIF. I'm Sean McElroy filling in for John today, but now let's take a look at the top stories. Nissan announced pricing for the LEAF will go up slightly in 2014. The base price is now just under $30,000, including destination charges, which is about $180 more than last year. There's not a whole lot new for 2014. A backup camera is now standard, and it's available in a new color. Last year, Nissan slashed the price of the LEAF by over $6,000 to help boost sales, and it sure did help. The company sold over 22,000 LEAFs in the U.S. last year, a 130% increase. Bloomberg reports that CEO Carlos Ghosn says the company is on track to sell 3,000 LEAFs a month in the U.S. and that 4,000 a month is, ne is the next goal, which would double the current rate. And speaking of EVs, electric car sales shot up more than 240% last year, but the sales figures also show that their growth is slowing down. In the fourth quarter, they were up 81%, and in December, they were up 15% compared to the month before. That's still very good growth, but it shows that the Torrid growth rate is slowing. The Nissan LEAF and Tesla Model S dominated EV sales. They showed spectacular percentage gains compared to the year before when there was a limited inventory, but now their sales look like they're hitting a plateau. There are seven other EVs on sale in the U.S. market, but even if you add them all together, their numbers are about one-third of the Tesla Model S. However, with the BMW i3, Tesla Model X, and Cadillac ELR coming into the market, the EV segment should continue to grow. And it's going to be fun to watch and see just how this segment develops. And now let's take a look at a couple of reveals ahead of the Detroit Auto Show. Audi's first compact SUV, the Q3, will make its U.S. debut in Detroit on Monday. It's standard with a 200-horsepower, 2-liter, 4-cylinder engine that's mated to a 6-speed Tiptronic transmission. Front-wheel drive is standard, and all-wheel drive is available. And as you would expect from Audi, the Q3 offers a number of convenience and safety features. The 2015 Q3 will hit dealerships this fall in the U.S., but pricing will be announced closer to its launch. And last up is the off-road version of the Volkswagen Beetle called the Dune. It's similar to the new Beetle Dune concept the German automaker showed at LA in 2000, but VW says it has a greater potential for production. This concept also gets the same turbocharged engine and DSG transmission as the Beetle R-Line, a 2-inch body lift, and a more aggressive tires. And speaking of the Detroit Auto Show, We'll be bringing you live coverage from the floor on Monday, January 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, thanks to our signature sponsor, Chrysler. We'll be interviewing top executives from Audi, BMW, Chevrolet, Chrysler, Ford, Mercedes-Benz, and Volkswagen. And that's just on day one. As always, you can watch that show right here at our website, Autoline.tv. Coming up next, a look at a couple of vehicles that weren't quite good enough to make it to the final list for the North American Truck of the Year Award. Proven on the track and on roads around the world, Borg Warner turbochargers improve fuel economy and reduce emissions without sacrificing performance. Borg Warner, official turbocharger supplier to the IZOD IndyCar Series. Next week, the jury of the North American Car and Truck of the Year Awards will announce the winners at the Detroit Auto Show. As you know, John is on that panel, and he invited two of his fellow jurors to discuss the vehicles that were up for the award on AutoLine this week. Here's a clip from that show where they talk about the trucks that just missed the final cut for the North American Truck of the Year. Okay, so the finalists were the Acura MDX, the Jeep Cherokee, the Chevy Silverado, uh, another vehicle that may have been cheated out of a third finalist position was the the GMC Sierra, which is a kiss and cousin to the Chevy Silverado. Well, I mean, it's, I think that's one of those interesting sort of politics of, of jury um, decisions that we make. 
Um, I, I think people look at it as well. The Silverado is the volume play. It's going to sell more. It's it's probably the thing that comes first to mind for for a new pickup for General Motors. So if you like the package of this new full size pickup, you're probably going to put points behind that. I like the styling of the GMC better than I do the styling of uh, the Chevrolet. Yeah, I think in my instance, the, the volume trumped the styling changes, you know, the styling differences. You know, I think I'm with you, John, that I like it a little better. And that's kind of where they want to go with that brand, too. It makes sense that, oh, well, maybe that's a little cooler, a little, you know, more exclusive, a little bolder sometimes. Uh, but I think as you put, as I put my votes out, I had to go with the one that's going to do more volume. Just quick, uh, another vehicle that was on our, our short list but was not a finalist was the, the long wheelbase version of the Hyundai Santa Fe. Any thoughts on that? I think it's a, you know, I, I've driven both versions extensively. Uh, I think it's a wonderful package. It's very well thought out, easy to drive, comfortable, easy to park. Um, it, it's a smart family vehicle. I, I don't know that it moves the needle. Yeah, I think the Koreans are doing a really good job with their crossovers. I think the Kia Sorento is also a very, very good vehicle. I think uh, they are providing touches that you wouldn't necessarily expect. They're really upping the ante in terms of the equipment level for the money. So the value for money story is, is there and their quality story has gotten so much better. Well, and, and the other thing that they haven't really figured out until this point, until this last generation, has really been things like steering feel and suspension. Um, when the last generation uh, Sorento came out, the ride was terrible. And then they introduced these dual flow dampers um, only on the high end models and then they, they kind of filtered it through because it transformed the handling. And they, they've gotten much, much better about that. I, I guess the point is there's some really terrific vehicles out there. We're talking about the three best that made it to the end of the list. Joining John for that show is Chris Pockert from Autoblog and Jack Narod of Kelly Blue Book. And you can watch that entire show right now at our website autoline.tv. But that's a wrap for today's show. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend. Wards is the industry leader for news, data, and analysis. That's why companies across the globe subscribe to our premium service, maybe even your own. Log in for subscriber access now. Check your company's intranet for details and rely on wardsauto.com to keep you informed.